Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Link Senior webinar. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin today. We will be providing one free NCAP CEU credit only to participants who are jo joining us live today. We are not able to provide CEU credit to those who don't join the live event. There will, however, be a recording of today's event. To be eligible for CEU credit, if you join us live today, you need to remain on this webinar for the full hour, and the Zoom meeting room is going to track how long you remain in the room and send that as a digital report to me. We are not able to provide CEUs to people who join only by phone. At the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box. And I'm also going to send that survey link through a constant contact email message. Please be sure to check your email spam folder this afternoon because it may have landed there. You must fill out that survey if you want CEU credit no later than midnight this Friday, March 20th to be eligible for the NCAP CEU credit. If you are not looking for CEU credit today, we still want your feedback. So please go ahead and fill out the survey as well. CEU certificates will be issued on Monday, March 23rd, next week by email. And again, please check your spam folder in case it lands there. And now I am going to hand it over to Charles Devo Morin, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Charles? Thank you, Megan. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. I usually thank people for joining uh, on our monthly webinar, but given the circumstances, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say, I applaud you for taking the time in your day to stay educated given the uh, circumstances. And uh, as you might have understood, uh, we're going through an interesting, a um, troubling crisis for our industry, for our society, I, I should say. And so at Link Senior, we thought it was important that we um, bring one of the best persons to educate us on how to deal with today, tomorrow, and as far as possible in the future. Again, my name is Charles Vilmoren, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Um, I've been thinking about this webinar in the context that I started Link Senior about 11 years ago, and probably and obviously has never seen something like this. And I was thinking of what should I start by telling people. And you know, on one hand, I'm not in a building running activities, right? Um, I ask my team to uh, not come to the office on Friday, but I think that we're there for you. And like many other people across uh, the US, across Canada and across the world, we are here for the elders in the sense that we're there in spirit. And we are, at Link Senior are very lucky to have the opportunity to serve thousands of staff members like you and to touch the life of over, over 40,000 uh, residents. So my thoughts are as follow. One is, I just want to thank you. We want to thank you for taking care of our old adults. What well, you do, showing up at work this morning, um, spending time with our old adults is probably one of the most important things, and I just want to personally thank you for that. The second thing is, regardless of what we're going on, what is going on, I think that it's important to remember that what we do, what we convey, the power of activities and life enrichment is often more contagious than whatever we're facing right now with COVID-19. Kindness, kindness, sympathy, love are more contagious than the virus. I think that this is a huge opportunity for us, what we've learned and what we do every day. Activities I believe has always, but truly today even more, is the lighthouse and what keeps a building, a community, stay a community for us, our team, our residents, and the families. You know, we talk a lot about social distancing, but it is not social distancing. Activities should continue and it is not social distancing, but physical distancing. So a lot of what we do can still be done. And I think that this shall pass, right? July 4th is coming. We will get through this. 
So the question is not how do we plan for next year or the fall, but how do we make sure that we go through this as best as possible. And the last thing I want to add is I welcome you to stay until the end of this presentation because we at Link Senior are happy to have special announcements, NCAP has special announcements, and the Pioneer Network, one of our uh, partners, has special announcement as well. With that, um, I'll just skip through these just in the interest of time. I just want to share the fact that we've done a number of these webinars in the past, only focused on resident engagement, so I encourage you to continue uh, joining us. And if you have any suggestion on uh, presenters and content, feel free to recommend them to us. As some of, um, as some of you might know, uh, Link Senior is a resident engagement platform for senior care. And we have a publication that was released last uh, September that highlights the quality of our work. I wanted to tell you a little bit more about today's presenter. Today's presenter is probably one of the best person that we can have for this. Her expertise is unique. She is a activity director, director of life enrichment in one uh, community in Maryland, but she also serves as the corporate uh, life enrichment person for a, uh, chain, for a chain called Future Care in Maryland. So what's interesting with Dawn is that she does what you do today, which is that she uh, builds programming for residents, but she also supports her sister communities. Some of you might also know Dawn because she's the president of NCAP. And uh, she's been staying in touch with all the regulations going on. And essentially, um, the background of this webinar today was COVID-19. What does it mean for us in programming and activities and life enrichment and resident engagement? So there's this number that I couldn't find an updated um, one, but last week there was an article that was saying that 53% of U.S. senior living communities are in or near counties with coronavirus. So essentially our assumption at Link Senior, our operating assumption is that every single community is or will soon be under some kind of lockdown. Activity departments are asked to uh, limit or cancel outside, cancel outside help, uh, cancel group programs, keep people six feet apart and in some cases in their room, and obviously we need to increase one-on-one -on -one room visit and individual activities. So the purpose of this webinar today was to try and understand how, what can we do about this, one, and two, how best can we provide engagement to our residents. So with that, I'm going to let Dawn take it uh, with us. I do want to mention the fact that we've received a lot of different questions. And so um, we're going to try to leave about 10, 15 minutes for questions at the end. Also, as a note, uh, which I forgot at the beginning, to say that at the beginning of this webinar, is that we've reached the limit of our Zoom uh, meeting. So we want to um, thank you for your patience with us. If you have somebody that couldn't get in, uh, we will be providing the recording of this webinar one and two, we are going to do a follow-up webinar in two weeks, uh, same day of the week, Wednesday, April 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern. With that, Dawn, I'll let you take it over. Okay, well, thank you. So, um, as Charles said, this is really unprecedented. We are all in uh, this situation, and we're doing the best that we can. So, uh, working in long-term care as an activity director, I think provides a little bit of insight into what are the challenges, what are the successes we have been running, and also to be able to provide So the first thing that I want to do is advance this to the next screen, if we could. There we go, is understand the most recent CDC and CMS guidance. Now, um, as we were all signing on here, CMS is releasing new additional guidance within the next few minutes related to PPE equipment, personal protective equipment. Um, as it regards to this webinar, we are going to use the most recent um, CDC report of March the 10th and the most recent CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Guidance, released on March. So, advance. 
And uh, there we go. Thank you so much. So here's what we know from the CDC. And first, I'd like to highly recommend that the information that we receive and that we disseminate on social media or within our departments, let's stick to those experts. Um, and experts being the CDC, CMS, American Healthcare Association. There are so many variations that I have been seeing on social media and also some of the news channels where they're taking sound bites and snidbits. And I think uh, we as humans sometimes interpret them a lot differently. So what we know is that COVID-19 is a pneumonia of sorts. The virus is capable of spreading easily and sustainably from person to person uh, based on the available data right now. And I think one of the important things to understand is that this is a brand new virus. So the only information that we as, um, as Americans have with the CDC is information that came from the World Health Organization or uh, countries like Italy that have been uh, sharing with us the data that they have received. The World Health, World Health Organization describes the virus as being highly contagious. There is no immunity against this virus um, in the population because it's a brand new virus. There's currently not a vaccine. And currently when someone does, does get the virus, uh, COVID-19, the only thing we're able to do is treat the symptoms. And this is why the CDC has added guidance for people who are at higher risk for serious illness, which is uh, people's 70 years old and older, which is typically a, a demographic in which we're serving in our long-term care communities, our assisted living, and some of our uh, independent living communities also. The, uh, the CDC is releasing guidance for those that are living at home or independent living just to make sure that they have the health supplies they need, but then also making sure that we do not um, hoard supplies, whether that's at home or we as healthcare workers uh, may be uh, thinking, well, I, I need to make sure I have enough supplies at home in case something happens and I can protect my family. So we just have to be cautious and wise. The new guidance that came out from CMS today talks about how they're really giving us some guidance as to when and what PPE equipment should be used. There is an incredible shortage. We don't want to use it as a precautionary, unnecessary precaution now, and then not have it when we really need it when we're faced with treating someone with COVID-19. So some And that is um, that it is spread. I'm going to get that slide over to you. Don, you're kind of breaking off a little bit. Can you, uh, is there something you can address? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, wonderful. I'm so sorry. Do we need to go back one slide? Yeah. Okay, if we could go back one slide. I'm not sure why this isn't. There we go. So facts about the transmission. And this came from the CDC. So it is spread person to person. The virus is mainly spread person to person between contact, close contact within six feet. Um, through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or, coughs or sneezes. These droplets can land anywhere. They stay in the air for up to three hours. Uh, someone can spread the virus without being sick. And I think that's the, the uniqueness of this is that there are many people that may be infected out in the community that think it's seasonal allergies or a really bad head cold. Uh, and, it, and, and their symptoms might be very small. And then you have someone who is older that could be uh, affected much differently. Can someone spread the virus without being sick? So that's, that is that answer. How easily is the virus spread? Well, according to the CDC, it's spread possibly um, or, or actually through touching surfaces and then also person to person and droplet contact. So it's important that cleaning equipment, and I know that CMS's guidance 
uh, on infection control. The CDC has issued guidance for nursing homes to make sure everything gets wiped down. We'll talk about that in a slide for what does that mean to activity professionals and how can we continue uh, to do our programming. And that it is community spread. Uh, we do have community transmission. The fatality rate in the elderly right now is 15 to 20 percent, and that was, again, according to the CDC. Uh, and it's important to remember that we have to, uh, to keep in mind that as we watch the media, we're going to see these numbers rise drastically, and that's mainly because we're testing more. So we're just realizing who actually is, an, who actually is affected. goes through CMS guidance that was updated on March the 13th, 2020. And this is what we really are here about today, where it says facilities should restrict visitation to all visitors and non-essential healthcare personnel. CDC and CMS, they have identified what non-essential means. That's the barber and the beauty shop. That might be the vending machine uh, provider. So visitation only under certain compassionate care situations, such as end-of-life situations. Uh, facilities should re review and revise how they interact with vendors. So the pharmacy or the equipment uh, providers, mattresses or ventilators or um, the pharmacy, uh, companies that come in and draw blood, our laboratory, and even our nurse practitioners and our uh, contracted physicians, specialists, and psychiatrists that come in also. So in lieu of visits, facilities need to consider offering alternative means of communication with people who would otherwise visit. Their recommendation was virtual communication via phone or video, video communication. We're going to talk about that today. Creating and in cre creating uh, communications some type of system that you can get updates out to the family members. Uh, I think everyone now knows about uh, not visiting into nursing homes. The American Healthcare Association is doing an incredible job of gathering anything that is relevant to long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities, and they're placing it on their landing page of their website. So that way, as soon as guidance comes out, it's right there, one place you can find it all. They also are posting regular uh, newsletters or kind of daily updates of things, uh, just pulling information together. So on there, again, it talks about March 14th, restricting all visitors, volunteers, non-essential. Activity staff is essential, very much essential. We'll get into that in a little bit. Canceling all groups and communal dining. So I know that there are uh, some differences. I've been seeing, you know, the CDC says limit to groups of 10, social distancing or physical distancing up to six weeks. Facilities are uh, recommending that residents stay in their room. I think it really is a case by case and the facilities are, or communities are making that decision. But as far as the CDC is concerned and CMS is concerned, they're still saying you've got to use your best judgment as to what's best for your facility uh, or your community. However, residents can come out. You know, in our communities that I work in every day, we don't have 30 people in a room together, but we're also not restricting a resident to come out and sit out on the patio or get some fresh air or sit in the hallway and talk to their, their neighbor across the hall, you know, across the hallway talking. Uh, so we are trying to make the best of the situation. So there's not a, an extreme on either end. You have to do what's best for your facility and what, however you're located. How do people, what kind of space do you have? But that's really what it says. On March 14th, CMS issued two waivers to aid skilled nursing facilities in addressing the national COVID-19 outbreak. CMS is waiving both the three-day stay and the spell of illness requirements because what they need to do is they need to kind of empty out those hospitals that so they can fill up the nursing homes with residents that we can handle at this point in the event that as a community, we find ourselves with a, many elderly people 
getting COVID-19 and requiring emergency hospital ventilator respiratory care. So that's why that was done. Um, also, as the state of emergency, the president declared a state of emergency. Yesterday, CMS issued new guidance and a memorandum that is based on the newest recommendations from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. It di uh, directs, again, nursing homes about visitation and how to handle vendors. So I encourage you to go to these sites because these are the experts that are posting the, the updates daily. And I, I think it's important for us, if we could go to the next slide, is to understand that we need to take a moment and we need to realize that for activity professionals, this time is when we have the opportunity to really shine. Uh, it, to show off the communities of what we're made for. Oftentimes, uh, the activities department isn't clearly identified by all community staff as to what we do and the importance of what we do. Uh, I, I like to think of it as that we do our job so well, we make it look so easy and we make it look so fun. And I will tell you that in this time of crisis, uh, we are equally as important to what we do as the nursing staff is to keep someone healthy. There's a great quote that I have here. Your hardest times often lead to the greatest moments of your life. Keep going. Tough situations build strong people in the end. And I can tell you that as an activity profession, a professional, uh, we are very mission driven. We're looking to solve everyone's problems. We're looking to make sure that we can change the life of one person every single day. And um, this is really challenging. So I want all of the non-activity people that are on this call today is to, you know, pat your activity staff on the back and tell them thank you for how hard they're working. Because, uh, you know, if it wasn't difficult enough to provide engagement to our population when there is group, group programs, this really is going to take an entire team effort in order to uh, fully engage our residents. Well, this is our opportunity to take a horrible situa situation and showcase our creativity, our compassion, our resilience, and our competencies. I also believe that uh, facilities are looking to us to help manage and direct the administrators and the other staff as to what interventions and support is needed to engage residents during these difficult times. If you think about it, the administrator is dealing with making sure he or she has enough supplies, resources, staffing. The nursing department is also very much focused on our resident health, checking temperatures, making sure that there are no signs or symptoms of our residents, in addition to making sure that our staff are healthy. So when it comes to engagement and when it comes to implementing these types of regulations, it is us, the activity directors, that are solely going to be the ones that uh, need to help lead this force uh, that we're doing. So I want to go ahead and advance to the next slide and talk about... I'm not quite sure why, and I apologize, my, I look down and my microphone keeps going on mute. So technology changes the world of engagement as we know it. This is probably the most exciting thing I can share with you today. Uh, all of us, or many of us, have a cable provider or a satellite provider within our communities that broadcast into our residents' rooms. You will be surprised to see that you most likely have, or and you have the ability to create a live broadcasting channel. So we found this out at my community on Friday. We expanded it through our entire company uh, within yesterday and today. And we now broadcast live activities into the residence room on a dedicated channel. So for us, it's channel 26. So just think of it. Our residence turn on channel 26 in the morning and in one of our offices, we are calling it the broadcast room, and we're broadcasting the daily, the daily news, horoscopes, 
we're doing exercise and residents are in their rooms if they have on channel 26 they're exercising with us we've been doing bingo today we did wheel of fortune and we brought one resident from every unit to the broadcasting room to compete against each other in this time of crisis this is where we shine this is where we have to think outside the box um, and all this took we have laptops I had to go buy a $10 digital to analog converter that converts the coaxial video and, and audio input into HDMI and a Zoom account, which was free. So on our website, www.nccap.org, we have a dedicated COVID-19 page. There are a series of videos, YouTube videos, that show you exactly what do you need to look for? This is going to be something that your administrator and your maintenance director needs to be part of. It goes through um, the videos show you how to connect. So this is game changing, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because if you go to the NCAP website, you're going to see all the videos from how do you set it up to my very first day, uh, my experiences running it for an entire day on Sunday. Uh, and what I learned from it, uh, but it, it's actually, in, I can't even tell you, game-changing. Also, make sure you go to the NCAP Facebook page because we are engaging activity professionals and answering as many questions as we can about the rules, the regulations, and how do we engage. So if we go to... Uh, this picture here talks about how creative and just how maybe desperate the situation is right now. Can you imagine, and I'm sure all of you can, because we're, we're living and breathing and, and um, talking to our residents, how difficult it is, number one, to be in a community. No matter how beautiful, how wonderful your community is, it's not their home. And we do our very best. And one of their bright spots is to have family members come by. And now to restrict that for their health and safety and your family's health and safety, we found these pictures off the internet and permission was given to use, but families are coming up to the, the, the windows and they're sharing messages or they're making phone calls. Now I will tell you that this is very much dependent on what your facility, uh, you know, what, what happens if you have a resident on the third floor, you certainly don't want the family member on the ladder trying to look up, up the stairs. There are some communities that are actually discouraging this because they, uh, you know, are challenged with what happens when you have many residents or many family members who get this far and now want to come into the building. Um, so you really have to decide whether or not what works best for your residents. But I think the important message here shows that communities are being creative and that's what we're looking for. We want you to be creative and keep your keep in contact with your families as much as possible. So the next slide actually talks about how do you communicate virtually with your loved one. So there's two different types of programs you can use, Skype and Zoom. I want to talk about what I'm familiar with, what we have been using here. So again, um, there are communities that are just using their personal phones and they're calling, the staff are calling family members and they're using Facebook Messenger video chat. They're using um, FaceTime for someone that has an iPad to, or an iPhone to an iPhone or any type of Apple product to Apple product. A Skype and Zoom is a video conference that you're attending right now. And if we didn't have this PowerPoint on here and we uh, turned on our videos, we could actually see each other and communicate to each other. So, uh, you know, I will give you one example of a community. They have four nursing units. Each nursing unit has a dedicated iPad uh, that has Zoom already connected with a personal video conferencing uh, um, program set up on it through Zoom. And then you go to the company's, way, so the, that's what the staff use. The family members will then be instructed to download, and I'm just going to use Zoom. There's, it's not a promotion about it. It's just what I'm familiar using. Uh, the family members will download Zoom on their tablet, on their computer, on their phone, and then they would be directed to that company's website that has a dedicated virtual communication page 
they click on the the community in which their loved one lives and then they click on the unit in which their their loved one lives and it's connected that meeting id when they join the meeting it's com it's connected to the ipad associated with that unit and then we're been, we have been able to uh, zoom back and forth. We make appointments with our family members. Uh, it's been very touching. It's been very emotional, uh, and it's very well needed. So we are able to do. We have uh, in my community. I have 200 residents. We have five iPads, and we are reaching an enormous amount of families every day. We're trying to keep visits to about 15 minutes in the beginning, so that everyone has the opportunity to video chat. And again, this is under CMS's guidance for facilities to challenge facilities to figure out a way uh, that, that you can do this. The next slide is, um, you know, you can find these instructions on how to use Skype or how to use Zoom. And I would just encourage you to Google that if you don't know, uh, since I personally have been using Zoom to connect like the live broadcasting that we're about to talk about right now. Um, all of that can be found on the NTAP website. So here's my experience because, you know, I, I was so, like many of you, overly stressed, very, very stressed uh, the last couple days about how am I going to do this? I have 200 residents. How am I going to reach every single person every day? So. On the weekends, I have two activity staff to 200 residents. We did live broadcasting. So as you see right now, this is in the room that um, that my assistant is sitting in. We call that the broadcasting room. He was doing activities. After we connected our TV sets, every TV in the community, who residents who wanted to watch it, they turned on 26, and we were able to reach uh, all 200 if they turned it on. Uh, but we ended up reaching a little over 100 that day. That's more engagement that our residents got from us as activity professionals than they did when they were allowed out of their rooms and in large groups. Uh, the facility staff were so excited because, again, we're looking for ways to improve the quality of life of our residents. They're coming up to us, asking us how we can help. And, you know, one of the challenges in long-term care is that so many times we operate in a silo and to try to get assistance from other departments is very difficult. During this time, I have been uh, rejuvenated to know that in this time of crisis, all of our departments are coming together. Just what can I do for the residents? How can I help them? We did exercise to Motown music. The residents were exercising in their beds and in their rooms. The staff and the residents were singing. You could hear them singing down the hallway. We had a gentleman who has, uh, is his preference, he has not gotten out of bed except to get a shower in a very long time. He was exercising and said it was the most fun he had on a weekend. During lunch, we broadcast it live and played music. Um, we started uh, getting cell phones, uh, cell uh, calls from residents and staff asking for specific songs to be requested. If we go to the next slide, I want to talk about bingo. We played bingo in the afternoon. Bingo. We copied bingo cards. We distributed them through the units. We asked the, the facility staff for help. Everyone keep an eye on call bells. We called it the call bell bingo. We had 31 residents play bingo from their rooms. And the nursing staff and the residents or the nursing staff was running up and down the hall as the residents were either putting on their call bell or yelling out bingo. And we communicated through a group text to the bingo caller. So if a call bell went off, then the unit would say, hold up, we may have a bingo. Yes, Miss Mary has bingo. Here are the numbers. It was fantastic. We ended the day with a cooking class. Our broadcaster was demonstrating live on camera how to make chocolate chip cookies. We put them in the oven, and as we were coming out of the oven, the cookies were coming out of the oven, the dietary staff was hitting the units and delivering hot cookies and cold milk to our residents and staff. So this changes the world of activities. We also, on the NCAP page, has come up with a lot of resource pages. And I don't want to read these slides just over and over again because all of this is on the NCAP page. I know that we have lots of Q&As and we want to get to as many questions as possible. 
So again, we've reached out socialization, intellectual, creativity, lots of games that you can play on here. This is all listed on the NCAP page. Brian Reif, who is our um, tech guy, has been updating this. Physical games. So, so let's talk about this. These physical games. Um, ball toss, balloon toss. For the, for the purpose of activities, when we talk about social distancing, I have received personal questions like, well, Dawn, can I still do a manicure? Dawn, how can I do a balloon toss? Dawn, how can I get into someone's room if I'm, not, if I'm supposed to be six feet away? For engagement of each other, resident to resident, we're looking for the C CDC's recommendation is six feet away. For us, we are care providers. We're going to be hands-on. We're going to make sure we're washing our hands. We're going to be using the hand sanitizer for the resident. We're going to be cleaning the supplies. Human contact is still very much essential and okay. Lots of music activities that are on here too. This is also, um, in the next slide, we talk about service work. This is a great opportunity for your higher functioning residents to help the staff out. Clipping coupons that can be left at the nursing station. Uh, helping assemble facility newsletters, cutting decorations for bulletin boards that can be used in other residents for themselves. Spirituality, there's some great examples for that also. Um, Self-help is on the next slide, and on the next slide, again, facials, manicures, hair pampering, shoe shining, mending clothes, all the things that we would do. So how do you run your department? Oh, and self-help and then cognitive and and stimulation, and I know that um, that's going to be a big question. What do we do with our people that have Alzheimer's and dementia? And let's wait till the end and we'll, we'll try to wrap that up. So how do you run your department? Number one, breathe. Know that we've never been in this situation. Whatever you do is better than nothing. I would recommend assigning specific tasks to your staff. So I've really had to step back, and um, since now we're doing things on a more global basis, I'm assigning staff to specific units or specific floors. Um, we are using the live broadcasting, which is fantastic because now one staff member can broadcast throughout the building and my other staff, as well as any other resources that are in the building, can help do one-on-one -on -one visits for those cognitively impaired, those residents that require some sensory stimulation. Don't be afraid to assign tasks to the nursing staff. Trust me, you'll be surprised they want to help. They want to help, they want to make their residents happy because they know, let's face it, if the residents are happy, they're going to be off the call bells a little bit more than uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. So let's help elevate their spirits. Evaluate your activity schedule. So even though my activity schedule is done for the month of March, I didn't redo my schedule. What I did is did a daily chronicle. So I do a daily, uh, a daily activity sheet that we pass out every morning. And I've modified it. What can I do on my live broadcasting? I remind all the residents to turn on channel 26. Uh, and we do have, um, you know, carts that are set up, supplies that are set up. But I had to modify it to what was reasonable. I will tell you that today is Wednesday. So Sunday was a trial. Monday I went gung-ho. We did almost everything that was already scheduled. Tuesday morning um, is when I sat back and I thought, you know what, if this is going to be eight weeks, I need to be more realistic. I, don't, I, I can't overwork uh, my staff because I believe that my staff is working harder now than they did when they were running groups because we're all over the place. They're trying to hit as many people. Check on all your residents because there is a risk for isolation. Make sure you're communicating to your nursing staff. If you have a resident that seems more depressed, that seems very tearful, uh, that's making any comments that uh, would indicate depression or suicidal ideations, immediately report that to the social worker and the nursing staff. Our resident's psychosocial well-being is important. Remember, you can only move as fast as your shadow, so you can't do it all. Make sure that infection control procedures. So all of your electronics, the recommendations that we have um, from the CDC and the infection control preventionist that um, we have that we are have engaged in, alcohol pads, 
or what we're cleaning our electronics with, the alcohol wipe pads. Uh, we are using non-bleach disinfectants to wipe down all of our activity supplies in and out of residence rooms. You can get that from your maintenance department. And then of course, any of the high touch areas, your carts, your handles, uh, we're using the bleach wipes that were given to us by our maintenance department. The next one, what about April schedule? How do you prepare? Now, uh, the regulation never mandates that we have to have an activity calendar in each room. Uh, that is not a federal mandate. Your states may vary. Your company may expect it, and it may be a marketing uh, tool. It also might be the way that your company does meet the regulation of having an orientation calendar. So what my plan is is to put up an activity blank calendar for the month of April that says, as long as we are living through our, you know, COVID-19 uh, restrictions, daily activity calendars will be passed out each morning. And that's how I'm going to handle it. Uh, and again, we just do the best we can. So now the last part I want to talk about is um, self-care. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to define it. What is it? Rule number one, remember that you are amazing. But I always look to the serenity prayer for guidance. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. I can't change COVID. I can't change that I can't have group pro programs and I can't change that I can't have um, groups and, and, and church groups and volunteers in. The courage to change the things I can. I'm going to challenge you to think creatively outside of the box. Go take a look and see how you can live broadcast into your residence rooms. And the wisdom to know the difference. And sometimes that's going to take you a little bit. It took me a few days to figure out what I could and couldn't change. Everything you do will make a difference. And it's better than doing nothing. Number one rule, also take a break from social media. All of you are on here because you care for your residents. We get that. I have lived and breathed and my board of directors have lived and breathed on uh, Facebook pages to help answer as many questions. I myself said to my board, I'm taking the next two hours break from social media. And you have to too. Listen to the experts, not personal opinions, because you would be surprised how quickly those personal opinions go viral. Rule number two. Rule number two, make sleep part of your self-care routine. Make sure that you limit caffeine, sugar. It keeps you awake. I know that's kind of an oxymoron for those of us that work in healthcare. We also want to make sure that we eat right for self-care uh, and make sure that we eat all together. Last week, I was finding myself running around and it was three o'clock in the afternoon and I hadn't eaten and then I felt sluggish. We have to take care of ourselves. We also have to know that it's okay to say no. And it's also when to say yes. We, we as healthcare providers and especially activity professionals don't do a good time at scheduling things for us. And we need to make sure that we do schedule some time for us. It's okay, it's not selfish. Rule number three is that activity professionals were made for this crisis. If there was ever a time to be that superhero that you know that you are, this is it. Take pride in it, take ownership, and take leadership. Manage the crisis, do not let the crisis manage you. Director, administrator, and director of nursing, they will appreciate having you in that leadership role. Relax and be proud, showcase your talents. So with that, that's, uh, again, we want to leave as much time for questions as we could. I know that I'm gonna turn it back over to Charles. We have a few more announcements to make and then we'll answer some questions. Thank you so much, Dawn. And um, I wanted to share the resource page that Dawn had shared with me. Obviously, the CDC was mentioned, the AHCA was mentioned, CMS was mentioned. Dawn has mentioned it several times. NCAP.org is probably one of the best resources for programming activities, life enrichment staff in general, and especially these days through this crisis that we're going through. Donna and her team are making an amazing job at making sure we sh they share with us the latest information. And obviously, as we know this, this situation is changing on a more than daily uh, uh, frequency. So I encourage you to, um, to check that out. We also have a partner called the Pioneer Network that just released this morning a huge resource library to combat 
isolation. This is what we do in activities. This is what we do in resident engagement. We are here to help our residents live with purpose, and that includes fighting isolation. And obviously, it's even more challenging right now, given, um, given our situation. I wanted to share a couple of things that we're doing with Link Senior, and we then we'll move into questions. And um, we, we've been working very hard at Link Senior to help you, to help every single person in uh, activity, life enrichment, wellness, resident engagement. So one, um, as you might know, we've reached the limit of this room today. Apologies for the people that couldn't join. We will be doing another broadcast on April 1st with Dawn. And um, I was discussing with Dawn, I think that the focus that we're going to have on April 1st is going to be an update on updates. Basically, we know that in two weeks, things are going to be different. What have we learned? What can we share with you as we talk to thousands of people like you? And obviously, we've got a lot of questions around dementia. So dementia and uh, helping people, our residents living with cognitive change is going to be a big focus of that one. The second thing I was, I was going to share is we have a huge announcement at Link Senior. If you go to our website now, and I'm going to be changing to um, my screen here, we have just released a huge library, a resource, a free resource for you and your team to help understand what are the best things out there in terms of engagement. You can see there's a banner here on our website. If you click that, it will take you to a special page um, with resources for you and your department. The last thing I wanted to share with you is throughout COVID-19 at Link Senior, we are dedicated to help you engage your residents. In that idea, we have decided as a team, and our engineers and team have worked very hard to accomplish something, which is that we are going to be providing most of our services for free to anyone that needs it now until July 4th. It is available now, and I'm going to show you how to get to it, and there are no strings attached. If you go to our website here, as you can see, we've labeled this whole effort of ours activity strong, because together we're strong, and we can go through this together. As you can see here, there are a number of resources, including tip sheets, the resource library, webinars I mentioned. If you look at technology, sign up is where you want to go. Sign up will take you to a page that you can fill in with your basic details. I ask that you follow the instructions, one, two, three, and we will get back to you so you, have a, you can have access to our evidence-based award-winning platform so that right now you can start engaging your residents the best possible. With that, I want to thank you again for your time, and we're going to get into questions because we are activity strong. Don, the first question I had for you, and I know that you've highlighted it, but it is important for everyone to hear it again. How essential are we in activities? So we are very essential. We're listed in the federal regulations. So even though the federal regulations, CMS said that they are not going to be as stringent, we have a little bit of leeway, we are still expected to provide those generalized programs. The National Certification Council for Activity Professionals do have a professional uh, position statement and the explanation as to why activity professionals are essential. Um, it is on our website, uh, ncap.org, uh, but I do uh, want to make sure that you see that. Under FTAG 679 for programming, we still are expected to provide programming. The type of programming we are doing, of course, is, is really guided by COVID-19 and the restrictions, but we are essential personnel. So in other words, Don, no one is at risk of losing their job, correct? No, they're not, and okay. they shouldn't be. And we've put that position statement on there in case there are companies that need a little clarification are, and are unsure as to who is essential and who is not. We welcome them to share that and to give us a call or to reach out if they need more clarification. Thank you, Don. The next question is, um, 
Well, the next question is with the nest, but I think I'm going to try to put it in one question. We've had a lot of requests to discuss uh, people living with mild to severe cognitive impairment. For example, you know, how do I wash the hands of my residents living with dementia? How do I make them understand or how can I um, manage the fact that sometimes they cannot understand the, sh the physical distancing that is required. Can you speak a little bit about that, keeping in mind that we will have a webinar focus on that coming up soon in two weeks? Yes. First, let me say you're absolutely right. It's the biggest challenge we have right now, and we're all trying to figure it out on a daily basis. We're looking to um, the experts to give us some more guidance. I can only share with you personally what we're doing. So what we're doing is spending a little time with the residents and, and helping them move away from each other. Um, having uh, the hand pumps of Purell uh, almost in our side pocket like Rosie the Riveter had with her drill, we've got Purell bottles and making sure that we put it in their hands and demonstrating how to, uh, to wipe their hands with Purell, taking them to wash their hands, um, wiping down our equipment. You're not going to be able to keep them um, into in isolated into their room and, and there are huge fall risks by keeping them in bed. So the, the best thing I can do is just use your best judgment, try to keep people away uh, less in, as smaller groups as possible. Hand washing is essential, we know that. And if anyone has any signs or symptoms, I'm sure your community would be putting in different restrictions. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> Another question is, um, how do you organize your time, right? Um, I think the, the main assumption is our job description as an activity director um, is sometimes impossible, but with everything going on right now, it's we can't get to everything, right? So for example, um, you know, we are asked to keep our family members in open communication and their satisfaction level. We are asked to do things related to residence council, to also talk with our dining services. We can't get to everything. Can you please help us understand how one should think about organizing that time? What are, the, what are the top one, two, three things that you believe you should spend most of your time on as we go through this crisis? Absolutely. So in morning meeting, and I'm sure all of you still have your stand up in morning meeting, I'm making a general announcement of what needs to be done and looking for volunteers immediately as we start our day such as we have mail that needs to be delivered, help being delivered. Um, who can take that? Can my dietitians take it? Uh, I've been very fortunate that we've had such a, a good working group of people together. Um, in regards to resident council, I'm gonna have resident council coming up in two weeks. I'm already thinking about that. I'm not gonna be able to get them together, um, but what I uh, am creating in my head and by the time we come back together for part two. I will have already worked it and told you what did work and didn't work, but we're creating a checklist uh, using um, the abacus for activities and asking the residents to check off what's good, what's bad, uh, things that they want to bring up. And then I, as the activity director, will correlate all of their comments and then go back and search for a little bit more information. So we really are, we're gonna pass it out. We're gonna let the residents who can fill it out, fill it out put it in an envelope, seal it, and give it back to me, and I will be able to review all of their comments and then see if there's any trends that are going on in particular units, particular times, and being able to communicate this. Again, uh, we welcome any uh, comments, concerns, thoughts that you have, uh, but that's the way I plan on handling it. Uh, and then I also look at my staff every day, and it's been changing. Remember, we've only been doing this since Saturday. Uh, as an official mandate from uh, CMS or the CDC. So every day I meet with my staff and every morning I give them an assignment of, a, you know, someone's broadcasting live, someone is uh, focusing on taking the iPads around and help contacting the families, and I have someone uh, that, that's doing room visits on really the cognitively impaired, severely impaired. Okay, great. I'm sorry, Don. I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to get back to something because we're getting a lot of questions around uh, your calendar. Yes. Um, can you explain again the process that you're going by with the calendar? Some people are asking exactly what you're doing. Would you mind, you know, the different steps that you, you have? 
Absolutely. So the first thing I'm doing is taking a look at what I had already pre-scheduled. What did I have on the calendar that I was hoping to do in a group format? And then in that point, again, because I'm live broadcasting, um, to give you an example of today's activities, I think we started out with 930 with a good morning greeting, horoscopes, and that type of thing. Uh, at 945, my administrator came on and gave a welcome, just a sense of calm. How are you guys doing? I'm here for you. This is what we're, you know, we're, we're providing. Just a, a little touch base kind of thing from the administrator. Then our chaplain came on and did a prayer, talked to the residents. At that point, we were broadcasting live exercise. So my activity assistant turned on the music. She exercised and residents were seen and uh, we validated the fact that they were also exercising in their room to the best of their ability. After that, we did, uh, right before lunch, we did a Wheel of Fortune game. That Wheel of Fortune game is on the NCAP website. We broadcast it through the TVs and we did it with residents competing against one another uh, and our staff competing. This afternoon we have bingo. And then that's all our live broadcasting. Uh, and that's, that's a heavy day also. Uh, during lunchtime, I'm using the free tours through museums and we're broadcasting that through channel 20 or our, our channel 26. Uh, right now, I also have a sensory video playing during this time that's going through the aquarium. So every day they're getting a calendar each day. I'm using activity connections with their daily signs. So on one side, I'm printing off the Daily Chronicle, a little newsletter, and on the back is the modified activity schedule. I'm not changing the large calendar. In April, I plan on just hanging up blank calendars in everyone's room to meet the regulation of having orientation, an orientation board or orientation program available to them. And it will say at the bottom, please see the daily broadcast or the daily activity sheets for what is scheduled during this time of COVID-19. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, Don, um, we've got a lot of questions. What I'm gonna do, Don, is send these to you and maybe we can connect and make sure that we address all of them uh, after uh, on our next webinar. I wanna thank everyone for joining. Um, again, good luck with everything you're doing, truly. Thank you again for taking care of our adults. Um, the last request I have for everyone on the line, and it is a repeat of what Don said, is please take care of yourself. You are often the um, enabler of the psychosocial, of the well-being, and the source of purpose of our residents. And the more you take care of the, the more you take care of yourself, the better they will live. So with that, I wanted to share. Um, Obviously, as you might know, we have this campaign called All People Are Cool. Um, our contact information are here. We will be following up with the re recording of this webinar. We have upcoming webinars. Oh, we had upcoming webinars that I encourage you to visit on our website. And with that, I'll let Megan uh, finalize this webinar with different uh, administrative aspects. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charles, and thank you, Dawn, as well, for your insights today. And I just wanted to share every, with everyone that Charles will be posting in the chat box. He's going to enable the chat box right now and post the survey link to the SurveyMonkey for CEU credit for NCAP only CEU. Um, like I said at the beginning of the call, please fill out that survey before midnight this Friday. The certificate will then be issued to you on Monday uh, by email, and be sure to check your spam box for that. We have received a lot of emails about folks who weren't able to join because we hit the 1,000 person limit on the Zoom room. As Charles mentioned, we're doing a repeat of this event live on April 1st. It will also have free NCAP CEU credit, and I will be sending a registration link for that to everyone who wasn't able to join today. Um, thank you so much, and um, Charles, thank you for sharing that with uh, the chat box, it's in the, the survey is there now for folks to click. That on. is correct, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And keep an eye on your email for that as well through constant contact. Okay. Thanks,
Yeah, thanks, Megan. Don, thank you very much for this. We've we also been receiving a lot of questions about what I said about Link Senior and its free access. And while we have one minute left, I want to again explain to everyone on the line how to get to that. If you go to our website, which is linkedsenior.com, you will see that we have placed a special banner. If you press on that banner here, you will have access to the recording of our webinars, to the immense resource library that we're making available for free for you, your department, and your organization, tip sheets about technology, and the last thing that I was sharing, which is how to get access for free to Link Senior, and a lot of questions about how long. Right now, we're going to help you get to July 4th. And so right now, we're doing more than 90 days free of our services, um, and we'll reassess them. I, um, I ask you to follow the instructions here, right? And you should get started. With that, please take care of yourself. Good luck, and as Don was saying, we will get through this. Thank you very much.